Welcome back to the reinvention show. And I'm so excited to have you all here as we explore how can we not just survive the winds of change, uncertainty and disruption that we are all facing no matter what part of the world or industry or even type of organization we belong to, but also how can we thrive in all of it? How can we enjoy? How can we achieve? How can we have a meaningful life in the midst of uncertainty, volatility, and sometimes as the war in Ukraine shows a real tragedy? I would love to know where you're joining me from. I am still in Columbus, the state of Ohio in the United States, and it's always amazing to see what a diverse, diverse community we have here with the reinvention show and the entire global reinvention movement. And I have a special treat for you today as you are typing up and letting me know where are you joining us from? For me, this is an always an opportunity. It's like a feeling of a reunion. Um, I have an amazing guest, a person who is first and foremost, a person who reinvented himself more than once, being a professional sportsman in rugby, having a professional career, and then moving into business, becoming a real name in innovation, reinvention, and change, a podcaster and author. I'm very excited to have an opportunity to explore this topic of personal reinvention and the mindset of person, pers personal and permanent reinvention. But I see in the meantime, Germany is in the house. Florida is here. Hi, Sherry. Happy to have you. John is here from Austin, Texas. Exciting to see, as always, uh, a community coming up. And it's my great, great honor. Canada is in the house. Hi, Sue. Yeah. Happy to see you. It's my great honor to bring back to the reinvention stage Aidan McCullen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Great to be with you as always, Nadia. And hello, everybody. Happy, happy, happy. Are you back in Ireland? I'm always mixing up. Where yeah, no, I, I'm in Ireland. I'm, uh, I've am i only done a little bit of traveling, actually, since things opened up. And uh, I did a few workshops overseas, but only in Europe. But uh, yeah, it's and it's good weather here for a change. Good. I'm, happy, I'm hoping we can bring you to US sometime soon. But in the meantime, this is a beautiful opportunity to learn from you yet again. And all of you guys know what a fan I am of this book <laughs> by Aidan, Undisruptable, A Mindset of Permanent Reinvention for Individuals, Organizations, and Life. And I want to speak about the mindset of permanent reinvention and why it matters. So I shared with you in the past that I get a lot of messages, uh, kind of a biggest myth busting <laughs> that will happen today. I get a lot of messages from our global community that, you know, this all sounds great, but it's not for me. I'm uh, in a nonprofit and reinvention is most suited for businesses. I am not a leader in an organization. I'm just an employee. So once I become a leader, maybe reinvention will be relevant for me and stuff like that. And for you, as it is for me, I know because I read it and because it's in the subtitle of your book, right? <laughs> that the mindset of permanent reinvention is crucial for individuals and life as a whole, not just organizations. Tell me why. Why should the mindset of permanent reinvention be a priority on our list? Well, something that you cover a lot, Nadia, and in your books and your research, etc., you know the half-life of organizations, of business models, of even industries is becoming shorter and shorter. But that means so too are the individuals who work there and their the lifespan of their jobs essentially and and we know this and i think it, uh, what happens a lot for people in our industry is people maybe think we're creating the problem or scaremongering a little bit when we're talking about that but we've experienced that and many people have experienced that that things are getting shorter business are getting shorter and we've seen friends during the pandemic for example lose roles lose jobs businesses shuttered time and time again so this is happening around us uh, and i think things like the pandemic are accelerants for those changes and it gives us an opportunity to kind of go look told you <laughs> and but the thing is we forget that we have experienced so much change in our time on the planet yeah. except in the last 50 to 70 years it's been relatively quiet and therefore i i always see this as a muscle our 
our reinvention muscle or our change muscle or our evolution muscle has atrophied and it's become sa saggy and soft. And therefore, many people in my, certainly my generation are a little bit soft when it comes to change. And the, the cycle, the mentality, and this is why the, the mindset part is so important. The mentality is I'll get a job, I'll go to college for four years, I'll get a job and I'll stay in that job or that industry for the rest of my life. And that becomes a bit rote and repetitive. And I, I certainly don't want people to experience that, but some people are happy with that. And that's fair enough. That is, if that is what you want to do, that is, you are so necessary. People who are worker ants or worker bees within organizations are very necessary. But the problem with that is they're often repetitive tasks. And those repetitive tasks, as we know well, are the ones that are first taken by AI, artificial intelligence, or some type of algorithm. Yes. Yes. So you can see that in the professions all around us. It's no longer some sort of distant future. Accounting. Just a few years ago, most of my company's accounting was done through human beings. We now moved almost everything to software. We just kept the high-level financial director in the areas where there is decision-making involved. But in terms of routine bookkeeping, in terms of um, allocating the specific expenses to specific types uh, of categories, none of that is anymore done by organizations. Uh, bookkeeping, receipts, and so on, it used to be a whole job. Uh, right now, the phone scans them and the software automatically uh, recognizes and itemizes it. A whole bunch of jobs just in this one category, bookkeeping and accounting, became unnecessary. And these are people with college degrees, with decades of careers that suddenly discover that they're not exactly anymore necessary and they need to reinvent. And there is a lot of hurt and resistance with that. And I know you had... Uh, a beautiful, beautiful professional rugby career. And then um, just as it happens with every career, in the case of professional sports, there's a physical limit. Uh, some are trying to break it here in the U.S. Uh, Tom Brady <laughs> is big uh, to prove uh, that you can keep going and going and going. But it's generally there is a limit, as it is with any career. And you had to reinvent. How did you deal with that need to reinvent? Being in that life and the discipline required uh, to be a successful professional uh, in a sport and then moving into business, how did you handle it yourself? We're, we're talking to you, Tom Brady, by the way. <laughs> you require, man. Come on. Come on. <laughs> it was probably, I think he's married to Giselle. Giselle is probably like, Tom, maybe you should go back playing. Uh, you know, you're, a bit, you're around a bit too much at home, buddy. I think uh, anyway. she's been too long and she's like, I cannot handle it. Go back. <laughs> yeah. we're, a little bit of distance is good sometimes, Tom. So firstly, it, it's, it was a magnificent honor, uh, that, that career. I always saw it as transient and probably a little bit, you know, I, I used to think, was I too positively paranoid about that? And when I, when I use that term, I use it strategically because when you think of organizations like Intel, for example, or a great one reinvention organization, Fujifilm, they were positively paranoid about the future. They knew digitization was coming for them, Fujifilm, and they actively sought out capability building that would help them through an inevitable transition. And I only learned about that afterwards, which is why I wanted to write the book as well, because I wanted to share this, particularly for individuals to go build capability before you need it, because when you need it, it's too late because your brain goes into fight or flight mode. When you go into fight or flight mode, blood is diverted from your forebrain, which is responsible for your sound decision making to your fists for fight and your feet for flight you are less intelligent so do not wait until the crisis to make the decision you know that well nadia but many people still wait and they kind of go i have time etc which also speaks to the reason why it's permanent and it's ongoing because with the speed of change and the coming together of multiple technologies and i'm talking about things like 5g quantum computing we don't even know what those two convergences are going to do for the speed of change. We, we have no idea. Robotics, 
space travel. There's so many elements. And what we're missing is they're coming together and they're starting to power each other. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the speed of change is going to become exponentially faster. So doublings. And again, very hard for the human brain to understand those changes. So therefore, we need to be constantly building new skills for the future, mostly human skills. And one of the things that I did, and it was great, it was quite funny, actually, when I look at it in retrospect, towards the end of my career, I was injured quite a bit. So I, I, I wasn't that talented, but I was really disciplined. And no, gen, no, people think you I'm being humble. Google, <laughs> no, you should Google Aiden's career and stop it. Okay. I, anyway, I, I, way, I, people are defending Tom Brady. There's a whole discussion happening here about Tom. We, we touch, Tom we rocks. touch the nerve there. Tom, Tom Brady is, is absolutely magnificent. And what I love about Tom Brady is his discipline. Mm -hmm. Because discipline is a mindset and discipline, and, and I genuinely mean that the biggest gift a career in sport gave me was discipline, because discipline is a mindset that can be, I think of it like some type of um, laser beam that can be pointed at anything and go, I'm going to write a book, because people often ask me, how did you write the book? And I was like, kind of going, uh, what, what what do you mean by that? And they're like, "How? what's the process? And I was like, um, my and my frame of reference was, it's like going to the gym. I, I used to go every morning. Yeah, <laughs> you go and you write. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a discipline. And and it's important because that's a mindset. And equally important in that is, in mindset is mindset can be applied to anything. And there's multiple mindsets required. Yes. And when you know and when you study like we do, the convergence of so many trends in the world, we know what's coming. And we know it's going to be very, very difficult for a large number of people who are lacking the knowledge about this. And it's one of the things that drives me from my purpose perspective and my why and why every week I share these magnificent guests like yourself on the show is to educate people because they don't know. And I, I count myself as extremely privileged to know what's coming. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a scary way. I mean, you we have to lean into it. Change sucks in many ways. It's difficult. But we have to lean into it. We have no choice because the winds of change will absolutely knock us over. So when you when you accept that and you make peace with that, mm -hmm. then you turn it into almost a game. And I found a beautiful way of learning every week, which is having guests on the show and reading the book, interviewing them on the book, which is a massive privilege. And then the discipline of turning that into some type of loosely connected article that I write every week. That's also to build that muscle of mm -hmm. trying to decipher meaning from the data that, that I've experienced. And, and all those things coming together give you a lens to go, okay, I need to, to turn my life towards a life of service to try and shine a light on this change that's coming down the line. So people don't encounter change in a really negative crisis way and yeah. and that's ultimately how all this came together and in retrospect it makes sense when i was in the moment it's quite difficult and i talk about this uh, contrast between the highs and lows of a wave and when you're on the top of the wave enjoy it but it's transient <laughs> there's a trough coming and when you're in the trough know that if i do the work i'm going to be on the top of the wave again but it's also going to be transient and again you realize that and when you're when you're in moments of joy surfing on top of a wave you kind of go i'm grateful for this yes. yeah. if i'm if i'm too comfortable though i feel the breeze at my heels and i go i need to build some type of new skill or some type of new mindset or search for new business for my organization whatever it might be in order to be able to surf here again love that so let me repeat a few things that i'm hearing from you one is building capability before you need it. Because the moment crisis comes, there is no time anymore to build the capability and also your own internal resources in terms of the biology that kicks in in the fight or flight response is limiting your capacity, your mental capacity, your vision is limited, your hearing is limited, everything is limited. So you have to get it to the level of automation that it kicks in automatically the moment crisis is there. And that's why the discipline is so important, is really perfecting that skill all the way to automation. That's number one. Number two, you need more than one mindset. 
there's this idea that you just need to fix one mindset, which is, for example, the difference between fixed or gross mindset or discipline as a mindset or permanent reinvention as a mindset. In reality, um, mindsets is a, uh, is a combination of uh, lenses you see the world with and you need to keep them clean. You need to keep them sharp. Those lenses, those set of beliefs or assumptions around the world, world, they need to be updated and maintained. And if they are not updated and maintained, they start getting cracks in it. They start getting blurry and you are not able to see the world as it's changing dynamically. That's the second most important thing. And uh, the third is this consistency issue of sticking with it and developing habits. Few things that I want to point to those of you who are listening to us that you would like to uh, keep with a habit. Uh, you will see in the comments a link to Aiden's show. Amazing, amazing guests. Some are very difficult to get. For example, the forward to this book is by one of my Heroes from the 90s, the one of the first book I ever read in Rush, uh, in Russian, in English when I came from the Soviet wow. <laughs> was uh, it was still sold That's at that bar, time. I could I could buy the book, The Birth of Chaotic Age was still sold at that time. D Hog, the founder of Visa, the, the card company that really changed the way the world works. D Hawk was on your show. Um, John Carter, one of the best of the best of the best classics of change management from Harvard University was recently on your show. I mean, the lineup of guests. So guys, you have in the comments a link of where to find that show. The second thing, that blog that you produce is also in the links. Please go read it. It's also beautiful graphics, really provoking I think one of the artistry of Aiden's work is the metaphors and some of the most memorable metaphors also represented in the war artwork. And of course, uh, you can get the book. Some of the people in the comments already saying they got the book. It was just an incredible, incredible angle. So I'm happy to hear that. So let's double click a little bit on this consistency issue. The problem that we're facing today is that we have to move from the idea that change is a project. So it's something we do one time that has beginning and the end, that has a kind of temporary feel. So we change and then we go to the normal life. And that normal life continues for a significant period of time. And then there is a short term moment of change. That was the story of the 20th century. That was the reality in personal life and business life and so on. We have come to a place where all of those trends, whether it's technological disruption, political disruption, environmental disruption, and all of the convergence of the changes are creating a condition where change is the norm. And that moment of relative stability is more of a outside the norm. And that requires a, a, a consistency, discipline, and permanency that for most people feels like unbearable burden. This idea that I cannot just be done with change, that it needs to become a permanent state of affairs. How do we make it more joyful? What can we do to stick with it and be consistent with this need of reinvention? It's a great question. And that, that I know that comes up for you a lot. It comes up for me a lot in my workshops. And people kind of go, do you not get tired from reinventing yourself? No. <laughs> And for, well, firstly, I, I do think there's different types of people in the world. And a great metaphor I, I discovered was in if you take the ant kingdom, that if you if you take 100 ants and you put them into like a, an environment like a sand pit and you drop a piece of information to the ant is like an apple. Mm -hmm. uh, Eighty percent or so will go towards the apple like a great apple. We'll eat. Let's eat and feast like kings. And then about 20% or less will go and start to go, no, no, no. I, I think there could be something better than an apple out there. I'm going to look for strawberries or I'm going to go and see if there's any threat in the environment or opportunities in the environment. And I think some people are wired that way in society. Obviously, those people who probably first left the caves on the Great Savannah when humans started to, to wander out. And I actually looked at this from a mental perspective, from a neurochemical perspective, 
And the people, some people are more what's called dopaminergic, which is they have more dopamine levels. So they're more open to adventure, et cetera. We know this from yes. people are more adventurous or take more bold bets, et cetera. But I do believe that we no longer have a choice. And to go back to what we were talking about earlier on, the word computer, computer actually originally is a term used for human beings yes. who did rote repetitive tasks. Mm -hmm. And many jobs, if you break them down into their component tasks, are rote and, and, and repetitive, except the very, very human ones. And we've been deprived of many of those human skills and capacities in the last few years, obviously, because of this COVID world and digital world. And that's only going to proliferate with the speed of change. You, you already see many people don't want to go back to the offices. That's also probably a broken system and an opportunity to reinvent the working world. We won't go there today. But ultimately, if we lean on the very rote repetitive skills, they will be, without doubt, replaced. And that is not, for many organizations, them looking for extra profitability. For the organizations too, they're going to be in fight or flight mode. Mm -hmm. The organization is going to be in these, uh oh, we need to survive. Sorry, I know you've been in this company for 20 years. Your service is really appreciated, but we have to survive. And, and literally, that's the conversations people have. And it feels like in the moment, I cannot believe this is happening to me. After all, I've given you, oh my God, all those late nights and weekends I worked. Oh my, if I, if I, add up all the time I gave to the organization that I could have given to my own health, to my family, to my future, investing in my future self, I probably wouldn't have given the organization so much. So I, I say to you, don't. And that does not mean don't give your commitment to the organization. Be very efficient with your time, but absolutely save time for yourself. And yes. many people I coach, go, okay, will you teach me about time management? I go, it's more than time management. It's about energy management. you got to enter, manage your day around your energy flows. So for me, I'm best at reading or writing in the morning. So I do that. And I don't schedule any meetings. I don't do any one-to-one -one coaching. I try to not do workshops. Now, I have to bear in mind to get the best possible outcome for my clients. But mm -hmm. I'll try to focus things around those times. And I constantly learn in those in those moments mm -hmm. because we need to. And if you think about the time we waste, we waste so much time, like Tom Brady, we're talking about him quarterbacking in the morning. What will I do? <laughs> what which yeah. decision will I email? I'll clean up my emails and we send those emails. Screw the inbox. Don't even check it. Don't mm -hmm. don't do those things that can be done at any stage in the day understand yourself and and i think this is the starting point and if there's one message i wanted to get through today it's like you have to do the extremely difficult work of finding out what you are curious about what actually you will go back and repeat and do again because if you if you're not interested in it you won't do it mm -hmm. uh, i'm like this with my children i have an eight-year-old and a 12-year-old my eight-year-old i now coach he's playing sport and the other coaches are very serious and like kind of sometimes given out to the kids and they kind of go, oh, we would have thought you'd be a bit more. And I go, what's the goal here? The goal is to get the kid to come back next week. So it's got to be fun. Yeah. And that's the same for you. You have to find something you're interested in. But sometimes that takes work. That means reading beyond your industry, exploring podcasts beyond your realm of expertise, or, for example, I say to people who work maybe in financial services, think about the future disruption of that industry. It has to be something to do with Web 3.0, blockchain, crypto, digital currency in some way. Do a course in that. Yes. Find out if it's going to bore the heck out of you early <laughs> so it's not thrust upon you. And you might find some element of that that's been untapped yet that you are interested in. It might be you're in the legal profession you were a paralegal, that job has been replaced by artificial intelligence, but you might be interested in smart contracts. Lean into there, write about it, learn about it, become an expert in it, and you will become a sought out person in that realm again. But you gotta start, the first The first thing is curiosity, but you have to do the work. And think of yourself from a metaphor perspective as a honeybee trying to find a flower that you like the pollen from 
you got to go and do that work. And when you find yourself sitting on a certain type of flower on a regular basis, then you're onto something and take note of that and then rinse and repeat and become, a, you don't have to be an expert or a blogger or a podcaster in it. But if you do something like that, I certainly did it from my perspective, find something that I was interested in that I would repeatedly do and then formulate a discipline around it. So the Thursday thought is called the Thursday thought because A, I wanted to create a habit in the reader to expect the blog on a Thursday, but equally it put me on the hook where I have to deliver every Thursday mm -hmm. and same for the show. And I haven't missed one in six years, same for the show, same for the writing, because it's now become part of who I am. And I believe that it's a service. And I think one of the most magnificent things about what you do, and I know from my own perspective, it lights me up, is I know this helps people. Yes. And if you can find some way of giving to the universe, you'll be extremely happy. And that's ultimately what, if everybody did that, then we'd be in a much better place. It's not about profits. The profits, and believe me, the profits come, but not in the early days. It's like anything. You've got to build the muscle before you use it. So a few things just to summarize for uh, all of you. Number one, it's not time management, it's energy management. So this is a very important distinction, and I see that Sherry is resonating with that, that it's so important to experiment with your own energy levels. I, and I will demonstrate it with my own story. Uh, like Aiden, I used to have a blog, and I realized that I'm dreading and dragging my feet and hating the whole format. We tried a pre-recorded video, drove my family and my team <laughs> insane hate. The moment we went, went into real life format, I enjoy it. I come back to it. It's easy. I love talking to you. I love talking to all guests. Easy. <laughs> so you need to test it out. And it's not just one blog. You need to write like 20 to see, is this something that will stick or can I manage my energy differently? And is there something that is better fit for the way my energy is dispersed and used in my body? Number one, not time management, but energy management. Number two, get out, smell every flower around, find a flower that is relevant for you. Do the work of constantly exploring the next thing. Otherwise, by the time the next thing hits you, it will be too late. With the speed of change right now, it's not that we need to jump on a bandwagon on time. We need to notice the train approaching miles away because it will not be stopping at a stop. You will have to figure out how to jump on and be prepared. And that's very, very important. And the routines. Uh, for me, for example, I know that I think better with others. So my routine is having regular meetings with a group of friends where we help each other reinvent. And they're put on a calendar and they're there protected. And we are serving as a, a kind of advisory board so that we can help each other reinvent. Now, there is a question for you here from Sherry. How do you narrow it down if you are interested in a lot of things? Like Sherry, how are you doing? Yeah. There's too many flowers. How do yeah. you narrow it down? Which flower is yours? And by the way, we have here, of course, all the way from Europe, Miguel is sending you regards and love the tips as well. Great. Thank you, guys. So great to have you with us. Firstly, the 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 broad spectrum. So you, you love the, mer the meadow, <laughs> Sherry. You like all the flowers in the meadow. And I'm a little bit the same. So when I read books, I, I notice sometimes the author will mention another book. I'm like, oh, straight on and buy the other book. And, and then I kind of go, no, got to stick to the knitting here and make sure I, I focus. So one is the actually your cognitive capacity. So you, you only have a limited cognitive capacity. But secondly, what I what I genuinely do, and I don't mind sharing this. So what will a give me the dopamine hit that makes me happy? So I actually get addicted to doing what I do. And mm -hmm. um, that's important. But then also, how can that loose structure of what I do? So so for example, Nadia, you, Nadia loves the live format. Nadia is a brilliant facilitator. So facilitation and being able to extract meaning from what I'm talking about is, a, is an extremely valuable skill that can be used in front of a CEO or one-on-one -on -one in coaching or a room full of people or a lecturer. So to be able to see 
How transferable is that skill? For me, it's likewise with the innovation show. Listening to an author or reading their information, being able to distill it down is the same as writing. So no matter how original we think we are, we're constantly absorbing information and distilling it down. We think when we write it, it's our original thoughts, but it's a collection of many, many different people. So for me, what does all these things mean? It means at this very, very early days of my reinvention that I'm currently enjoying the top of the wave of, it was lecturing. And lecturing, the lectures themselves, were a collection of my blogs from the past mm -hmm. brought together into compelling slides that I was able to tell the story from. Equally, that information gathers together and then I distill it to become a story that becomes a book. Mm -hmm. Equally, then I collect many stories from that book and they become these isolated keynote speeches that I give all over the world. They're all, if you look at them all on, a, on a, a blackboard or a whiteboard, they may look like separate things, but to me, they're all the same thing. They're a distillation of knowledge that I'm really interested in. Because I'm interested in it, I'll, I'll retain that knowledge and then I'm able to articulate it back to an audience, whether that's a CEO, whether that's a boardroom, whether that's a lecture student in, in, in a lecture hall or a keynote or talking here today, they're all the same thing. And each of them will have a different value. And th this is a really important thing about many of reinvention audience are gig economy workers. And if you look at one of those things in isolation, it's probably not a great living in itself, but you put them together, your portfolio, and if it's diverse, it means that if one of those portfolio elements gets taken out by Schumpeter's Gale, so mm -hmm. creative destruction, then I have all the other things as well. So for me, the latest iteration on my reinvention is I took on a board membership role and I'm learning that skill. And I'm quite young to be in a board member. And I leaned into that aspect because they were looking for neurodiversity. So I jumped on that opportunity because I know my 65-year-old or 75-year-old self is going to go, Aiden, thank you for doing that world work 30 years ago. Look at us now. <laughs> and that's a really useful way to think about it. Love that. Love that is this really important idea of thinking about portfolio. You are not one thing. Thankfully, we live in a world where you are now welcome as a multi-dimensional human being if just 20 or 30 years ago moving between different interests or different formats or companies would be considered flaky or unreliable or occasionally even disloyal today you are in the other world in the other world where portfolio of interests projects career tracks is actually what protects us against every kind of distraction and i see that it's resonating so we are so thankful you could join us uh michael from germany is sending a lot of love and sherry is sending a lot of support i see Zuzanna here india is in the house uh sending you regards any last message for our audience when we're talking about mindset of permanent reinvention and starting in personal reinvention any last um, advice, yeah. wish, comment? So as, as you know by now, the, the reinvention never ends. So one of the things I'm doing is working on a, a new book. And again, I, I love metaphor because metaphor is a way of teaching. It's, it's my, my way of teaching and it's actually how I think. And I found a wonderful metaphor and I can't find the source of this. If you know the source, great. So you, we know about the clash of the Titans and the Greek myths. In the myths, seeing as we're talking about myth busting, Nadia, there's the story of the Gorgon Medusa. So Medusa, yeah. remember the lady yeah. with the snake, snake, the snakes coming out of her head, and you look at her and you turn to stone. Now there's a, a theory on that that actually what that is is the snakes represent all these venomous thoughts that we have, and that we have all these multiple thoughts. And and when I I, I learned about that, I was like, oh well. That's often the blocker for many people to reinvent because, and this is true, when you have a thought of some type of change, even a minor change, every reason, these snakes, why you should not do that comes to mind, including oftentimes people who you expect will support you the most. 
and it can be hurtful and painful, especially when you see it's them. But even worse than them, that's a role they play in your, if you think of yourself as writing your own script for your own life, mm. you have to have Joker to have Batman. You have to have the contrast against which to compare something. Alan Watts famously said, if you write black on black, you can't see the writing. You need a contrast. Yeah. So we need to know what we don't want in order to know what we want. So we need somebody to play that role. But don't let it be you. Don't let these snakes, these venomous thoughts block you from your right to reinvent. Because that, for me, is the biggest tragedy. And that's what drives me is to go, here's some information. I hope it will help. I hope it'll help inspire you and give you a method to think about and some story or some metaphor around which to wrap that thinking in order to inspire yourself to permanent really, permanently reinvent. Love that. What a great metaphor. Don't turn into snow stone by your own, <laughs> yeah. by your own uh, doubts, by your own self-critique, by your own acceptance of other people's words as if they're truth. Uh, reinvention is our birthright. We are born, unless there's a health issue, every baby is born reinventor. You don't need a bonus to start walking, you reinvent. And claiming that birthright, reclaiming that has been a great, great privilege for all of us. So thank you so much for joining us again. Huge, huge um thanks from our entire community can't wait to have you back with us sometime very soon thank you aiden a pleasure thank you thank you everyone take care and with that that's our show for today it's an honor to have you here always fun to look at different dimensions different takeaways pragmatic suggestions and if this resonates with you and you want to try it out we do have our now, legendary free live five-day workshop coming up called the Easy Reinvention Lab. This time, we're hosting it specifically for consultants, coaches, business trainers, organizational development professionals, internal, external change makers. This is for people who move and shake. And this time, we are all about elevating your own consulting, coaching, training, development practice. So we're starting on April 25th, it's always super interactive. You don't need to be there the whole day. You actually don't need to be there live. We host live workshop on Zoom once a day for one hour, and you have one workbook for that day. That's it. If you cannot make it live, you join us uh, and watch a replay. We usually make it fun with a lot of giveaways. We usually have a few hundred people, already 200 registrations and growing. We would love to see you at this easy reinvention lab because it's the last one until august it's one of our most important gifts to the world hosting this easy reinvention labs it's our seventh and we would love 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 to see you there so register today if it's not fit for you but you know somebody for whom this free live online experience is relevant please invite them from our end we are introducing our 10th reinvention method tool at this lab. Uh, we've never presented before. It will be a world premiere, the 10th tool. We also bring the tools of other schools of thought. So Blue Ocean Strategy Canvas will be there. Some stuff from neuroplasticity will be there. So we love, love, love to see you at the next lab. Join us. Excited to have you. And of course, I will see you at the next at the next show next Thursday, as always, 11 Eastern in the United States and everywhere around the world. Thank you all so much for joining me. I hope that you will have an amazing end of the week and I'll see you very soon.